All right, so I thought we should talk a little bit about USD Lingo first. So why is USD the way it is? Well, there's a lot of reasons for it, but um, I think the main thing to understand is that USD was meant to be as efficient as possible and as safe to work with as possible, meaning that you, it, it's consistent. And so on the left side here, we have uh, uh, a picture from Pixar trying to explain how these uh, hierarchies work in USD. I think this is the, uh, the biggest thing to understand about USD uh, is that normally, you know, each department would import their own things. So if you, uh, you know, if you're a layout artist, you would import the camera. If you're, you know, the animator, he would also import the camera. The light artist, he would also import the camera. And I think they just found out like, why is everyone importing the same things? That's highly in inefficient. And, uh, and so they decided like, hey, why don't we, you know, just export it into a hierarchy and everyone gets that hierarchy. And so, uh, as we see here on the, the, the right side, uh, you know, someone is working on the car, exports it, and that, that automatically shows up in the parking lot shot, for instance. And so there wouldn't be a need for each department to import their own things. And so I think this is the biggest thing to wrap your head around, that everything loads automatically. Um, if you try to fight that and, and sort of work with it, the, the sort of traditional way, you're going to sort of bang your head into uh, the wall, I think. So. What we see here on the right is called layers, right? Uh, so there's a car one layer, car two layer. Uh, the parking lot is also a layer. Uh, and so what is a layer? Well, a layer is nothing more than a USD file. All layers are USD files. That's all there is to it. Uh, sometimes we talk about sublayers. Uh, so in the parking lot here, the, the car one and car two, they would be sublayers of the parking lot. But all that means is that they're also they, they're just USD files that are linked in that files. So if you, in fact, if you go into um, uh, Solaris and you you import the the rubber toy test geometry, uh, that is actually just referencing a file on disk. So that's technically a, a sublayer now. So a layer is nothing but a USD file, uh, and if it's if if it's referenced in, you just call it a sublayer. Uh, there's also something called a USD layer stack, and opinions, <laughs> and uh, the USD layer stack. All that means is the order of um, of things that has been imported. So uh, normally you would set this up so you would have um, you know layout would be imported, you know, everything from layout would be imported, then everything from animation would be imported, then everything from FX would be imported, and then light and so on. And it, it's just a, a stack that makes sense, and you can uh, have whatever stack you want to, but uh, that is the typical stack you would use. And on the stack is, is just a bunch of imports, essentially. Now, <laughs> opinions, that is just uh, the order of the stack. So in USD, we talk about uh, weaker and stronger opinions. But uh, all that means is that whatever has been imported later on uh, has a stronger opinion. So for instance, if you, would, uh, if you would import a cube and then you import an animated cube, well, the animated cube is going to override the, the, the non-animated cube. And so it has a stronger opinion. But all that means is that it was imported later than the first cube. <laughs> so opinions is just the order of how you imported it. There are tricks that you can manipulate this a little bit, but for the most part, uh, you don't have to worry about that. Another scary thing is layer breaks. <laughs> so uh, the way USD was designed is that uh, it's, it's meant to export fragmented data, which means that if you have a, you, in Maya, if you, animate the cube and you export that, if you, you look at that file, if you bring it in, you would actually have that cube animated, be baked in. But with USD, that's not the case. So in USD, you use these things called layer breaks. And whenever you put down a node called layer break, it will just ignore everything that's above and it will only uh, export whatever is below. And so if you have a cube and then you put on a layer break and you move the cube and you export it, if you would, read that file back in, you wouldn't see a cube at all. And if you would open it up and actually read what's in the file, you would see that it doesn't even contain a cube at all. All that it contains is the new position that you moved it to. And uh, <laughs> some may think like, well, that's stupid, right? But the idea is that because the only way to see the, the change is to combine it with the original cube, um, the idea is that you break everything that's been you know, done into these fragmented data. So the data is small, it loads fast, 
And that's how you were able to have like lots and lots and lots of, of geometry and stuff like that. So it's, it's incredibly efficient in speed wise and stuff like that, but it does come with some drawbacks. And one of those drawbacks is versioning. Imagine the same example with this cube and we exported an animation of that cube. Now, in order to see the animation of the cube, both the cube and the cube animation now has to be loaded because they, they work as a, a, together, right? Uh, and they don't work by themselves. Uh, and so now you have a dependency chain because um, you know, if someone would uh, change that cube to uh, you know, uh, a sphere or something, now you don't have the same vertex points on it. Uh, and so the animation doesn't fit anymore, maybe. Um, and so how do you deal with that? You know, how do you deal with that dependency chain? So the way USD uh, or Pixar made it, um, thought of it was that instead of that, we, we pull in versions. Um, versions just get pushed. So you always use the latest stuff. And then you can roll back, you can reject things and stuff like that. But it is a shift of thinking that instead of um, bringing in what you want and selecting what you want, you basically select what you don't want. And the reason for that is that, you know, if, you, uh, if you're not careful, you know, all these, uh, the, the animation won't fit with the, the model anymore or the, um, the uh, material you're using is, is meant for another a previous model. And uh, now that doesn't work and stuff like that. So um, this is what, also one of the biggest things that people complain about with versioning, that there isn't a good way to do it. And there isn't anything sort of built in to, to do that, uh, to have that control. Um, there is idea, like there are things called asset resolvers where you can resolve things like that, but that's uh, things you have to um, basically code yourself. It's, it's nothing that exists uh, out of the box. And uh, it's a big uh, problem for working with, with USD in general. Now, another thing is that USD is read-only for the most part. And the idea was that, you know, let's say that uh, layout, they, they export a cube and light is using that cube for, I don't know, uh, maybe they're using it to measure things or to um, align something to it. And then another department deletes that cube. Now, all of a sudden, the, the, you know, the lighting artist, you know, all his scene is suddenly broken because uh, now stuff is missing. Um, and so the idea is that you cannot delete things uh, or rename things because it, it might someone else might depend on it. So once it's exported, it's it's out there. And there are some workarounds for this in, in Solaris uh, that you can use, but for the most part, it is a feature and not a bug. <laughs> so the idea is instead that you use overrides. And overrides, uh, you will find this on, on every node uh, that you can override things. And you can also put down nodes like prune to hide things. Um, but the idea is that instead of deleting something or renaming something, um, you do an override to hide it uh, instead. And uh, that way, it, you know, other people can always go back and use it, you know, unhide it and stuff like that. Whereas if you delete it, there's no going back, right? All right. So another thing uh, that might be confusing is print paths. Uh, print paths, uh, by default, every node has these pretty much. Uh, and um, by default, it's it's set to dollar OS, and dollar OS just means that it's the same name as the node itself. So if you create a cube, it's going to be called cube one. So that's going to be the print pad name. But the problem with that is that you know, let's say that you create a camera, camera one, and in your render settings and rock and stuff like that, you you set it up so it's it's going to use camera one, right? And then you're like experimenting, and it's like you duplicate this camera, and that you know because all nodes has to be unique now that it's renamed to camera two. And you do some things, you get more happy, and it's like, oh, I'm going to use this camera instead. And you connect that camera. Well, now all of a sudden nothing works because you have to change everything to camera two in your render settings and render up now because it's a different name. And so this is where print paths shine. So instead of dollar $OS, you can basically set a USD name. So if you name your camera to render cam, that is what it will always be called. And so even if you duplicate that node, the USD name will always be Rendicam. And then you can use that name uh, everywhere. And it has a lot of uh, positive uh, aspects to it. Essentially, you can create you know, empty folders for your know, car and, and just call it car uh, as a print pad. And then other people can add shaders to it and move it. And then once the asset is there, it will just inherit those as long as it has the same print pad name. And, uh, even in this parking lot example, <clears throat> it gives uh, artists more control. 
So let's say that you do have this car one, right? And it's been positioned in layout and stuff like that. And it expects something called car one. Now, if you download it, maybe a car from, you know, Turbo Squid and it's called uh, Lamborghini, <laughs> you know, how do you deal with that? You know, and so this again is where print paths come in. So you can just set the print path to be car one and, uh, and it will be car one instead of Lamborghini. And so it, it brings a lot of power. It's, uh, it's good practice always use. So a lot of these things, you know, they're solved by uh, other studios out there. Uh, each studio, you know, they, they make their own solutions based on, on what they need and their size and, and that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, how they want to deal with the safety aspects and stuff like that. But, you know, none of these things are uh, are, are readily available for, for artists. You know, there are maybe some solutions out there that uh, that that have some, but um, yeah, not a lot. All right, so let's talk about some practical issues as well that we wanted to solve. So <laughs> this is a network uh, from a shot, and this is usually what you don't see, what people don't show you. Um, you know, you're, you're trying to, to make everything very nice, uh, and uh, all of a sudden you, you realize you need something else, and it grows, and it grows in different ways, and you need more space, and suddenly you're, you, the network, <laughs> you know, it, it, it sort of has its life on its own, and you try to tame it with network boxes and sticky notes, but, uh, you know, it, it's not really possible. Uh, and so this was um, one of the big challenges to, to solve, like how, why does that happen? And, uh, you know, how do you solve that? And so this is uh, a more clean example um, to illustrate uh, some other issues. So a lot of times, uh, what you would see is that people make these lines. So each of these lines is one shot. So this is actually a, a commercial we did like four years ago. Um, and it's, it's pretty much vanilla slice. And uh, I think it's a good example to use. So at first you start out and you, you try to sort of like connect things, you know, these two shots share these things or whatever. Um, but you quickly realize that that's not going to work because you know, suddenly uh, you want shot one and shot five to, to share uh, things and, and then you have to restructure and stuff like that. So you quickly realize that like restructuring shots is not an option. So you find yourself, you know, doing these sort of lines. And first thing you need to do, right, for any shot is to set up sort of settings for that shot, sort of like frame ranges, right? Uh, each shot will have its own frame range and um, you just have to set that up per shot. So that's one or two nodes per shot that, you know, you have to do, right? Um, and um, you also have to be loading plates. So you need to set all that up and you need to set all the cameras up. Uh, and USD doesn't support um, image planes in cameras by default. Uh, in Solaris, they, there is a workaround for it. They've added one, uh, but it's it's for Houdini only. Uh, but that's something everyone has to do. So we're not just talking one artist here. You know, the animator needs to do it. The, the layout artist needs to do it. Uh, the FX artists need to do it. And if they have, if the, the frame ranges are not the same per shot, then all of a sudden, you know, things are going to break when you import. And with these departments, uh, you know, you, you everything is manual by default. You you have to um, basically like say like, oh, this is my FX file or this is my light file or whatever. And the same thing with exports. The problem with that is that there's a lot of room for a human error. So a famous example, yeah, I have is uh, we did a commercial with a squirrel. The problem is that because we're Swedish, nobody knew how to <laughs> spell uh, squirrel. So we ended up with like five different spellings of squirrel and it changed for every export. And so everything broke all the time because, you know, we couldn't, <laughs> we could, each department just wrote their own name for squirrel or their own spelling. Um, so that was a big problem as well. Um, versioning, of course, uh, another big problem. Um, some of these ROPs from labs, uh, they do have a rudimentary versioning control where you can set the version when you export. Other times you, you just basically change a number in the save path, but it's all manual to some degree. And most of the time you forget to version up and you realize that in the middle of your render, it's like, oh no, I just, I just uh, did a test render of a cube over my awesome full HD render right now. Uh, so that's, that's also a problem uh, where you uh, overwrite things that you weren't supposed to. Uh, the absolute biggest problem though is that all of these lines that we see here uh, are sort of in isolation. So it happens because the ROP 
the output is at the bottom. So the red uh, node we see here uh, for every shot in the uh, last is um, is the render op, right? And so it becomes it natural that all of these you know become in a, a straight line basically. Uh, but as I alluded to before, you know what happens is you know you. you Maybe for the first two shots, you're like, oh, those two shots are going to have, you know, uh, a night uh, light and uh, the other shots are going to have daylight. Great. So you think, you know, I, I can sort of branch it out. So that makes sense. But then you uh, then you all of a sudden you're like, oh, wait, but one shot one and shot three, they they're going to have the same asset in it. And, and shot, you know, seven and, and 14 is going to have the same shot. in it. And so you quickly realize that it's impossible to, to branch these things in a, in a smart way. And so what you end up doing in that is, is doing merge nodes and grabbing stuff from other branches and, and fetch nodes, you know, or you do what, what was done here to keep it clean is to, to basically, you know, clone or copy the nodes over. So every shot has like five nodes that are identical between shots, which is, you know, highly inefficient, really. And so it, it becomes a big problem like that, because, you know, the idea is that you, you're supposed to share things and override things, but uh, the end result is that you you don't. Um, you also have this kind of ROP overload. So in this one, you know, there's like 25 ROPs or something. And um, in this example here, uh, it, you know, pretty much every shot has one ROP, you know, one output, one beauty, right? Uh, maybe some has two. But normally you would have, you know, five times that. You know, maybe you have a foreground render, you have an, a background render. Um, maybe you have a, a breakdown render, maybe you have a preview render, uh, maybe you have a tech pass. And so these 25 nodes, all of a sudden, you know, if you do that, all of a sudden you have, you know, 100 or 100 plus uh, ROP nodes. And it's impossible to keep track of. And every ROP node has their own overrides and you forget which one has what. And after a while you forget which one had I, have I rendered now, you know, and you start marking them in different colors and, but then you forget to revert the color the next time you open the scene and so now you're even more confused <laughs> so that was also something you know we really wanted to solve um and so with the usd uh, issues and and sort of these practical issues that was the base uh for what we were trying to solve uh, and, and make uh, easier and let's dive into it <laughs> 